Okay, we have a uh, added treat for you today. Um, it's not just Dr. Stein anymore, it's Dr. Stein and the neurotransmitters. <laughs> oh, we have Diane, who's representing dopamine. Leslie, uh, Leslie is representing GABA. And, uh, and Ellen, yes. And Ellen is, of course, glutamate. Uh, because she's so energetic. And I know that a lot of you are familiar with the ups and downs, the on and off of dopamine. And uh, it's important, I think, when talking not just about cannabis therapy, but talking about Parkinson's and other conditions, that we try to understand brain neurochemistry. Am I the only person that's interested in brain neuro neurochemistry? <laughs> well, it turns out that when I started studying brain neurochemistry at 18 years old at University of Rochester, yep, I was a geek. U of R, Meliora. Um, it was actually because I was getting high and I was curious how it all worked. And so I decided to study uh, the neurochemistry of cannabis when I was 18 and here I am full circle, finally trying to understand it. And it turns out that traditionally, dopamine, GABA, and glutamate as neurotransmitters were what we thought controlled behavior and movement and sleep and anxiety. But there's something much more than that going on in the brain. It's called the endocannabinoid system. And I'm going to, with the help of the neurotransmitters, uh, try to explain the endocannabinoid system to you uh, in a way that's not too detailed, but enough so you can appreciate how cannabis works. Now, dopamine, come on over here. This is probably the most important neurotransmitter for Parkinson's patients, we know that. Uh, dopamine is in short supply because of nerve cell loss in the substantia nigra. And, of course, patients take dopamine agonists like pramipexol and also dopamine replacement therapy like Cinnamet to try to compensate for the loss of dopamine neurons. But there's other things that are going on in the brain that we can modify to help patients with Parkinson's. For example, GABA. GABA acts on dopamine neurons. So So what's, what's happening here is that the GABAergic neurons are slowing down the dopamine neurons. That's what GABA does. GABA slows things down. Whoa, so dopamine, you're slow. But glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Did some of you know that? I don't know. Well, anyway, glutamate, show us some, show us some excitation of the dopamine neuron. What about these neurotransmitters, huh? All right, let's, 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 all right, let's just pause, let's just pause. Now, when I was doing neuro at U of R and then at NIH, this is all we thought there was to balancing neurotransmitters and helping patients with neurological problems. But it turns out that there were researchers in Israel and also actually um, at, in Kansas City and at other places, discovering what's called the endocannabinoid system. It's six syllables, try it with me. Endocannabinoid. Endocannabinoid system is a system of chemicals that attach to receptors in the brain and control the other neurotransmitters. Who knew? All of that studying, all of that work, all of that treatment that 
I and other clinicians have been trying to achieve with patients modulating not just these neurotransmitters, but others like serotonin and oxytocin and acetylcholine and so forth. Who knew that there was another system that actually modified and controlled all the neurotransmitters? And that's the endocannabinoid system. So I will portray the endocannabinoid system. Okay, so you're like lowering the GABA, exciting with the glutamate. Now the endocannabinoid system comes along and does this. Removes the GABA. I could do that on the endocannabinoid system. And what happens when the GABA is removed? The dopamine-containing neuron can be more active because I've removed the inhibition. Okay. Let's say that there's too much glutamate and there's something that we call excitotoxicity. For example, in patients with epilepsy whose neurons are firing uncontrollably, way too much glutamate. This is how neurons die. One way is through excitotoxicity. So what do we do? The, the endocannabinoid system modulates the control of neurons through balancing neurotransmitters. Let's give a big hand to the neurotransmitters. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. You guys can actually. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am not high right now. This is my normal self. My endocannabinoid system is tuned right now. But, you know, sometimes it's not. And sometimes we need to tune those endocannabinoids so we can control the rest of the neurotransmitters. And how do we do that? We use cannabis. That's why cannabis works. Cannabis binds to endocannabinoid receptors in the brain, and those receptors control all the neurons. We didn't know this until the 1990s. Doctors never learned about it in med school if they went before 1990, and now there's only 10% of medical schools that teach anything about the endocannabinoid system. The molecules in the brain that represent the endocannabinoids are called anandamide, which means bliss in Sanskrit, and to arachidonyl glycerol. So just like GABA, glutamate, and dopamine, we have fancy polysyllabic names for the chemicals. Those are our endocannabinoids that we produce in our own body that bind to the receptors that control the neurons. It's the same as the endorphins. You know, when you use opiates, those opiates are binding to endorphin receptors but our body produces endogenous molecules, endorphins, to bind to those same receptors. So I want, hopefully, to convey this analogy. We have our own biochemical cannabinoid system in our bodies that we can maintain and promote through healthy diet and exercise, yes, through gut health. And we also have exogenous cannabinoids in the form of phytocannabinoids. And phytocannabinoids are the molecules in the cannabis plant. Is it coming together at all? <laughs> okay. Well, this is the story of how cannabis works. And this is why there are so many benefits of cannabis therapy. It's almost like snake oil. When asked if cannabis can help a patient with irritable bowel syndrome, or glaucoma, or autism, or Parkinson's disease? The answer is yes. Cannabis therapy can help all those patients with those conditions, because the endocannabinoid system is the major homeostatic regulator of human physiology. The endocannabinoid system 
is the major homeostatic regulator of human physiology. I get choked up just thinking about it. <clears throat> they never taught me that in medical school. But in 2017, when cannabis became legal for medical use in Florida, many of my neurology patients, I'm a neurologist, I'm a real doctor, I'm not a snake oil salesman. Many of my neurology patients, especially patients with multiple sclerosis, came to me and said, well, by the way, we've been using cannabis for the last 10 years. It helps with my muscle spasticity and it does work for MS patients. But now that it's legal, how do we get it? How do we use it? And so I'm going to jump into the real part of the presentation now and uh, talk with you about some of the nuts and bolts about how in the clinic we start cannabis therapy so we can help patients with their symptoms. The first case study I want to talk about pertains to sleep, which actually someone was asking me about just a moment ago. And I want everyone to know that I have, I have dinner uh, reservations at 6.30 tonight, but I'm available till then. So <laughs> if, if you want to meet me out front to talk with me about your specific question or needs or concerns, um, I'll be over by the True Leaf table. Sleep is one of the things that cannabis does best at. I probably could have said that a better way. Sleep promotion is a very important part of overall health. When we sleep, we rejuvenate, we renew, we recover. Very, very important. And Parkinson's patients have specific types of sleep problems uh, that were highlighted uh, last year at the Expo. There was a great presentation on sleep and Parkinson's disease, and that's available online on the, uh, on the um, NeuroChallenge uh, YouTube channel. So you may want to take a look at that. This is a case of a uh, high-functioning 77-year-old real estate CEO with 10 years of Parkinson's disease diagnosed who has chronic insomnia and is basically dependent on benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are those drugs like Valium, Ativan, Restoril, which is Temazepam, any of those sedative drugs which we use uh, to help with sleep. Those are, those are benzos. And frequent awakening. So the very first thing that we talk about in the clinic when someone is concerned about sleep is sleep hygiene. And uh, again, this was covered last year, but I'm just going to mention briefly that not everything has to be cured with cannabis. Sometimes you can cure with uh, lifestyle changes. So avoid caffeine, don't eat too late, make sure the room is dark and cold. There's all these different things we do that's called sleep hygiene, that's number one. And if you still have a problem with sleep after that, then we can talk about medication-assisted issues. And one thing that patients need is to help initiate sleep. And that's the question I ask. Uh, are you having trouble starting sleep? Do you have trouble falling asleep? Or do you have trouble staying asleep? That's an important distinction. A lot of folks say both. Um, and then we try to come up with a cannabis protocol, a treatment regimen for them. So for example, This particular patient is dependent on benzodiazepines. Let's say, for example, they take 30 milligrams of Restoril every night, and they've been doing that for the last 10 years. And they realize from their studies that these benzodiazepines can trigger dementia-like symptoms and affect cognitive performance, so they want to get off their benzos. So we use cannabis to help them get off their benzos and promote better sleep. And the way we do that is by using the proper cannabis product through the proper administration method at the proper dose. So three things. 
what is the cannabis product you're going to be using? Is it going to be THC, tetrahydrocannabinol? Is it going to be CBD, cannabidiol? Are you going to take it as a oral therapy, like a gummy or liquid tincture? And then what's the dose? Two milligrams of THC, eight milligrams of CBD. What is the dose? What is the administration method? And what is the cannabis product you're going to choose? And those three things for each specific patient and their specific problem needs to be figured out by someone like... I'm not saying I'm the only person that can figure these things out, but... I've spent the last seven years studying pretty hard on this, and I've educated about a thousand physicians around the world. I'm on the faculty of a couple of different online self-education platforms for continuing medical education, and you know, part of what I do is teach physicians, and because we don't know as a group. So yes, if you have questions or concerns and you want to email me or call, there's, I'm here for you. For patients that have trouble initiating sleep, they need to take their cannabis medicine in a way that kicks in quickly. The quickest way for cannabis to kick in is through inhalation. Most patients, though, are not really keen on inhalation if they're new to cannabis, and there's some drawbacks to inhalation. The next fastest way to initiate sleep would be to use liquid tinctures, drops under the tongue. That takes about 30 or 45 minutes to kick in. But if you're gonna use a gummy, which takes an hour and a half to kick in, you have to take it two hours before bedtime. So just because your nephew from Michigan gave you a gummy, <laughs> you know, and it didn't work, doesn't mean it's not going to work. You, maybe you just took it at the wrong time. And then of course, to maintain sleep, something like a gummy or oral cannabis would be a good solution because when you consume cannabis orally, the benefit lasts six or seven hours. And for sleep maintenance, you want your cannabis to last, right? Um, otherwise, you're going to wake up after a few hours when the inhalation wears off. Some patients need to take a short-acting, ra a rapid-acting short duration cannabis preparation to fall asleep, and then when they get into bed, they chew and swallow their gummy, so that when the inhalation wears off, the edible kicks in, and they get a full night's sleep. So we can stack the therapy like that. And what's gonna be in that therapy? It's gonna be THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. THC, delta-9, tetrahydrocannabinol, is the part of the cannabis plant that gets you high. I think probably at least two-thirds of you um, know that based on the aroma that I sense that. But, the, but Delta 9 THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, even though it, it has strong psychoactive effects at certain doses and will get you high, it's still very important in cannabis medicine. We need THC for sleep, not CBD. CBD at low doses, cannabidiol, at doses of 5, 10, or 15 milligrams could actually keep you awake. So all of these CBD vendors that are saying, oh, take my 10 milligram gummy to help you sleep, I don't think so. Sure, 10 milligram CBD can help you, help you relax, but in 20% of people, it has an alerting effect and can keep you awake. So no, don't take that CBD gummy at bed. There's so much to share with you. Let me just say quickly that CBD can help with sleep, but at doses of 25 milligrams and higher. So sometimes for patients that do not want to use THC, we can use high doses of CBD to promote relaxation and sleep. But if you don't take the right dose, you're not gonna have the right effect. You might even have the opposite effect. Our next case has to do with motor symptoms. This particular patient has a rest tremor with freezing and dyskinesia, 67-year-old man, who tried a gummy from someone at the boxing class. That actually may have happened, I think, to some people here. And, and success, the gummy worked. It reduced tremor and dyskinesia 
but the poor guy couldn't get off the couch. So he had what we call couch lock. And that's because there was too much THC. You know, this is, this is cannabis, it's, it's weed, it's ganja, and it's fun to talk about it as a recreational drug, but that's not what we're doing here. We're talking about cannabis as medical therapy. There's a big difference between medical cannabis and recreational cannabis. And it all has to do with your intention. Sure, if you want to be locked on the couch with your iPad and Netflix, not that I know anything about that personally, I'm just saying, if that's what you want and that's what you want your cannabis to do for you, fine. But if you want to reduce dyskinesia and use your THC in a way that still allows you to function, then you have to take the right dose. If you don't take the right dose, you're gonna be on the couch. So that's the difference between medical and recreational cannabis. It's all about the intention. I see a lot of patients, that just as an aside, that have been using cannabis their entire life as basically recreational. They use it to help them relax and that's fine. You know, I, I've actually been using cannabis my whole life. But when it comes to using cannabis as a medication, you have to be more mindful of what you're doing. What is the goal you want to achieve? What dose do you want to take? And what do you want to avoid? What side effects? What drug-drug interactions are you concerned about? So those are all things we take into consideration when talking with potential cannabis patients. This particular patient needed a reduction in the THC dose. And sure, one gummy is usually 10 milligrams, but a quarter of a gummy usually is two and a half milligrams, and that turned out to be the perfect dose. And that patient was able to reduce the hyperkinetic movement disorder. That's what dyskinesia is, it's hyperkinetic. If you, if you use too much cannabis though, it'll slow you down and you'll be on the couch, you won't be able to move. So patients who have freezing or bradykinesia and use too much cannabis, the cannabis can make them worse. So be aware, um, dose is everything. And one way that we control the effects of cannabis is by adjusting the amount of CBD and THC. So oftentimes, the ratio of CBD to THC is an important indicator on the effects of cannabis. Some of you may have used THC and found that it caused too much psychoactivity, made you anxious, paranoid, it was a bad experience. Understood, that does happen. When you combine CBD with THC, it mitigates the psychoactive effects of THC, reduces potential anxiety. We have all sorts of professional, high-functioning adults in our clinic. Did I mention I had a clinic? We've treated 5,400 patients in the last seven years. Crazy, crazy. High-functioning individuals. I, I know that, and I'm sure they can attest, and please do, share your success with the people next to you later. If the THC is too strong or will impair your ability to do your job or look after your grandkids, then you need to combine CBD with THC to mitigate the psychoactive effects. You need to take that medicine in the proper ratio with the proper milligrams and you'll succeed. And I can tell you that we have a very high success rate, but it takes time. It usually takes about two or three months to figure this all out because we start low, we go slow. We don't want patients to have side effects. But if you do have psychoactivity and it's too strong, so you crank up the CBD, lower the THC. That's one possible solution. Next case. Last, last case. 34-year-old, recently married veteran, has dream enactment behavior and a positive family history of Parkinson's disease. So this individual has not been formally diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, 
but has a condition that's often referred to as rapid eye movement, REM, sleep dis behavioral disorder. I'm, I'm sure some of you have that. Can, can I see a show of hands if you've been told or think you might have a sleep disorder? What happens with REM behavior disorder is instead of being paralyzed during dream sleep, which is the normal way sleep works, those patients are actually moving with their dreams and enacting out their dreams, punching or kicking or running. And it can be dangerous to themselves and their bed partners. And it's one of those conditions that often preclude, that often is a warning sign of Parkinson's disease. Uh, loss of sense of smell and dream enactment behavior can be early warning signs of impending Parkinson's disease. And it has to do with alpha synuclein deposits in the brain. We also see that in uh, dementia with Lewy bodies and uh, multi-system atrophy. So, yeah, I'm so smart. <laughs> but the point is, if you have dream enactment behavior, if you are at risk for developing Parkinson's disease, you want to protect those neurons. And this goes pretty much for all of us. Cannabis can help protect neurons. As we age, not only are we at risk for degenerative conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but normal aging also can affect our ability to function through loss of neurons. Cannabis therapy, this is the snake oil part, cannabis therapy can help prevent aging in the brain. And it does that by providing antioxidant, anti-excitotoxic, and anti-inflammatory effects. So much so that in 1999, researchers at the NIH published, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it was a patent. They published a patent on the neuroprotective antioxidant. See, I, I didn't use my cannabis today. They, researchers at the NIH published a patent discussing the neuroprotective antioxidant effects of CBD and THC. And that is available online, and it's a beautiful piece of literature. Cannabis protects neurons. Now, you can't be high all day protecting your neurons. You won't be able to function. So you need to use a combination of cannabinoids, like CBD and THC, and THCA and CBDA, which are acidic cannabinoids. We also use the aromatic molecules, the terpenes. That's what gives cannabis its uh, strong aroma. We use these different molecules in the cannabis plant to protect neurons from damage due to too much glutamate. Remember, I demonstrated with our neurotransmitter team how the endocannabinoid system turns down the volume on the glutamate neurons. The antioxidant effect of cannabis is more potent than vitamin E or vitamin C. I could show you that data if you want. And finally, the cannabinoid receptors that I told you are all throughout the brain also live on the lymphocytes, the microglia in the brain. So if you have an inflammatory condition where there's overactivity of inflammation, guess what? The endocannabinoid system can calm that down because remember, the endocannabinoid system is the major homeostatic regulator of human physiology. Thank you. I just get choked up when I say that. Um, I showed some references there quickly. If you want to learn more, um, you, can, you can find those uh, when the talk is published. Thank you. Thank you.